Sorry about the wait, guys. How's it going? Great. Yay. Woo. Yay. Hey, you guys. There's supposed to be 200 people. I kind of want to be like an Alan and Jenner. Good answer. Um, Six. Yeah. <laughs> go like run around. Um, who's seen me talk before? A few people? Wicked? Awesome. Um, so my name is Thursday Clark. Uh, this is my name. Uh, you can find me on the Twitters and everything. I'm at Darcy on Twitter, which is sweet, really sweet. Um, I always make the joke that I get a lot of missed tweets. Um, I used to show people what they always look like. Some of them are very uh, distasteful, so I stopped doing that. Um, you can also follow me at Darcy Clark on like, Instagram and stuff. Um, I travel around a lot. I don't really do much development anymore. I just like take vacation. You know? uh, it's pretty sweet. Um, I don't really work for anybody, I work for myself, um, but I call myself a developer, a designer, um, I'm a speaker, entrepreneur, mentor, uh, essentially everything, so if you guys need help with anything, I can probably help you out, we can go for coffee. Um, I've worked with a lot of cool big name brands uh, to build experiences for them in like a number of capacities. Uh, I've also worked with a number of agencies here in Toronto. Um, and worked on a bunch of um, open source projects, in, including like jQuery, something like that. Uh, I co-founded a company called Themify, which is also um, a WordPress theme company. Who knows? Anybody know? Yes. So, sweet. So you guys should know who I am, right? Yeah, wicked. Um, what I do uh, sometimes, and, and I give this talk um, in Berlin in December, and this is like a 20 minute version, um, but if I could, and I do this a lot of my uh, talks. If I could get everybody to stand up for like one second. Get up, get up, come on. I think we're going to dance. It'll take two seconds. Okay. Everybody, put your hands up, up high up in the air. Right? You're going to like, I just thought this straight, it's really tight. So. Um, okay, and take a deep breath. Hold it. Hold it. Okay. And let it out. And now sit back down. Um, so somebody once told me that taking a big deep breath uh, will put some oxygen into your brain. So for the next 20 minutes, I should have your attention. If not, um, well, I talk on its own, so it's my fault. Um, uh, so I do do this one thing, which I'm, I'm really proud of, uh, with Ahmed and a number of other developers. It's called Node School, and um, I teach people JavaScript and, and how to write notes for free every month um, for like three hours. So we give you free coffee and timbits. We're basically paying you to learn how to code. So please come. Uh, JavaScript is awesome. Um, so my expectations in this talk, so the future of CSS, there's a couple expectations. Maybe you guys know some CSS. That would be great. Um, and HTML would be awesome. Um, if you know JavaScript, something about preprocessors and build tools, that would also be great. Um, does everybody know kind of some 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 of this? Yeah, some are nodding heads. Um, what we're going to cover is a little bit of history, preprocessors, post CSS, a little bit inline styles. Ooh, right? Yeah, I've been doing this for like 14 years, so um, I thought we got away from this. Um, and the pros and cons. So the future of CSS. It's a sweet title, right? I, I do. I did the future of video like two years ago, and I'm the future of CSS. Next year will be the future of my Instagram account, right? Uh, no. Does anybody follow me on Instagram? No. Any creeps out there? Just no, I'm looking for them, the stalkers. Oh, there's one in the back. Um, so the future, we can't talk about the future without looking at the past. So I'm going to go through five acts. Um, I went to a performing arts high school. Everybody knows like five acts, the parts of a play. Yeah. 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 Any nerds out there? Drum nerds? No? Yeah, I was not in drum, I was uh, actually a visual artist, so I'm not very good at standing up in front of large groups of people. Um, so act one, cascading style sheets, the exposition. Um, so the history of CSS, uh, in 1996, we came out with the first spec. Um, I've actually met the guy who created CSS. Actually, I have a selfie with Tim Berners and Lee as well, which is pretty sweet. Um, I look super scared, because he's amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, so we created the first level, the first spec of CSS in 1996, um, and then that grew level two in 1998, 1999, level three, 
And then we had revision to level two, and, and then people are like, when's like, CSS level four coming out? And well, it's never coming out. Um, Tab Atkins, who's very active in the WQC and works on uh, CSS, um, wrote a nice blog post essentially about um, why there isn't going to be a CSS four. Um, we're done, CSS three was the last one, and now we just have de or we compartmentalized um, all the specs uh, into their own like little modules and we'll upgrade them. So if there's something new like CSS variables coming out, uh, that will be its own spec and we'll just upgrade and version those numbers uh, appropriately. Um, also, does anybody know who this guy is? Jacob Thornton? He wrote Bootstrap, really cool dude. His name is like at fat on Twitter because he used to work for Twitter, and I guess he really wanted that handle. I don't know why, he's the skinniest guy ever. Um, he wrote, uh, or he just did a talk a few months ago called Cascading Shit Show. Um, not the nicest name, but uh, he essentially also goes through the history of CSS a little bit more in detail than I did there. It's actually a great video. Um, it talks about the reason why we're in the state we are with CSS and why it sucks so much. Um, but CSS is awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody knows why. CSS is the best thing ever. It's awesome. Like, how many people would say that they're like a program developer, like in this room? Yeah, mostly. Who would say they're like a front-end developer that does like a little bit of JavaScript, but mostly HTML and CSS? Cool. Okay. Um, so the programmers were probably the ones laughing at the rest of us. Okay. Um, because CSS sucks. It sucks bad. It's not no variables, right? Well, it, default plain old uh, CSS variables are kind of coming. Um, no functions, like no dependency management. It's not got like any of the cool stuff that we expect from a language. That's because it's not a programming language. It's not supposed to be. It's not the, supposed to have all these things. Um, CSS. This is straight from like Wikipedia. Is a style sheet language um, meant to style HTML, right? It is not a programming language, people. Okay, so I don't know what you're expecting. Um, so Act Two, sort of the second phase of the evolution in the history of CSS, is sort of build tools and preprocessors. And you may have heard of grunt and gulp and all these weird G words that are just like, what the heck is going on? Um, so build tools, Node, npm, all these crazy acronyms. Everybody's going nuts. Um, and preprocessors, which we're supposed to be like saving the day. This is sort of CSS 2.0, right? So preprocessors are things like our languages like let, uh, less SAS, SCSS, Stylus, Rework. There's a number of uh, different preprocessors that are out and about. Um, and they include things like variables, functions, uh, extension, ways to extend different styles. Uh, they allow you to do things like dependency management, um, nesting, which is cool. Um, so they introduced all these when we didn't have them available to us. <coughs> Preprocessors suck. I'm going to put it out there. They're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. Who likes preprocessors here? No, after I said that, no. <laughs> no, no you're not going to admit it. I know you're out there. Yeah. Um, CSS. They, what? You're better than CSS. Right, okay. So relatively speaking, they're better than, yes, plain old CSS. Um, but preprocessors are like half-baked programming languages, right? And they're usually written by CSS developers, right? They were <laughs> written by programmers. Um, so we get these weird nuances in the interpretations of your SAS files, your LESS files, um, weird nuances that you wouldn't find in a normal programming language. Somebody trying to find their way here? <laughs> Heard some Google Maps. Uh, um, so there's also no standards. So these preprocessors are just out and about, they're, you know, uh, it's by committee how they get designed and the APIs that are used and how they interpret your code. And of course, they've fragmented the communities and the resources, right? Um, can you use bourbon with, you know, your stylus? No. Can you use um, foundation with, uh, let's say, um, your rework code? Uh, depends on how much sort of transformation you want to do on, on these different files. So it's fragmented the community, the front end development community sort of lock into the preprocessor stack, right? <coughs> so introduce, 
a new 0.5 version in the plays, in the dramatic play here that we are, the Shakespearean play of the future of CSS, is post-CSS. And you notice I use conflict, right? This is the conflict, because I've got some very opinionated opinions on post-CSS. Um, so how many people have heard about post-CSS? And everybody's being told, right, probably that's the future and that's going to help us, uh, you know, uh, well, yeah, shake your head, it's fine. It's not, it is not the future. Um, so if you haven't heard about what PostCS is, it's essentially a tool that helps build up um, an AST, which is a syntax tree, right? That's, yeah, or like, what is the, what's the abstract syntax tree, not a syntax tree, but an abstract syntax tree. Um, so what this means is that uh, you can essentially do, um, it creates like sort of a big JavaScript object um, that represents um, your CSS or whatever you cast into it. Um, and you can do some transformations on it, so you can write some JavaScript functions to uh, modify that uh, syntax tree. So kind of cool. So this is how, uh, this is like usage of how to use post-CSS. So this is like a gulp file. Um, if you haven't been introduced to gulp, uh, essentially it's like a task runner. Um, so I define that I'm going to use gulp, and then I require um, uh, the gulp post-CSS uh, package, and then I create this nice little task um, called styles, and then I pass in some uh, transformation um, packages that are actually going to work uh, against my um, my styles files. So you can see that I use this globbing pattern to essentially grab all the CSS files that are in a folder, and then I run my transformations um, against those files. So we can get some stuff like auto prefixing, so I don't have to write all my uh, WebKit and Moz prefixes on on different properties in CSS, um, as well as this uh, one. This one require here is pre-CSS, which gives you like SAS-like syntax in your CSS file. Um, <coughs> so that's interesting, right? Um, so pre-CSS, that one package I sort of noted there, um, is essentially a post-CSS plugin that allows you to use SAS-like markup, as I said. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You know, post-CSS is supposed to be like this new thing that's supposed to get us away from preprocessors but it sounds like we're just redoing all the work that preprocessors were doing before. So here's an example of what pre-CSS uh, <coughs> looks like. So this is basically exactly like SAS. If you've ever written any SAS before, this, um, you know, I've created a variable up here called color. Um, I've got some nesting going on. I'm using the color. I'm doing like a for loop down here to create some uh, H, uh, uh, header tags that essentially I'm styling and doing some fun stuff with that, right? Um, but this this looks pretty much just like SAS. Um, so we're not really making any progress here. And some of the most popular packages for post-CSS are the pre-CSS um, uh, package. And it's also the post-CSS SCSS package, which also has 40, uh, 4,000 monthly downloads. And of course, auto pre Prefixer is like the most uh, popular one, um, which is pretty handy. Um, but the first two really make me think, like, are we actually making any headway here? Are we solving problems? There must be a better way, um, because it seems like we're just using SAS still, right? So PostCSS is supposed to make this big change in our lives. So let's actually look at CSS. What, what is CSS? This is a rule set, um, basic, basic thing. Um, what does it, does anybody have an idea what this kind of looks like? It's just essentially a bunch of key value pairs, right? It kind of looks like JSON, right? Doesn't it? It does to me, at least. When I look at this and I sort of abstract away what's happening here, it just looks like JSON to me. Um, color could be a, a string uh, or a number or it could be a function, right? It's kind of interesting if you start to think of it that way. and. The interpretation of the actual browser of that CSS is a kind of interesting as well. If I inspect, let's say, this header in my browser, and I'll blow this up for you guys. Sweet. So if I do dot style on any element, right, this is the doc DOM or the document object uh, implementation. We get this nice CSS style declaration object. And what's kind of interesting is 
this is the interpretation of the browser, right? This is how in JavaScript you will change CSS um, with JavaScript to animate or to change styles. But you'll notice that actually everything's camel cased. Um, it doesn't exactly look exactly like our, our CSS that we wrote on this slide back here, right? And that's actually because it's not the same. So there's this huge map, if you go to MDN, you can actually see what the one-to-one -one is. It's basically camel casting of all properties, um, which is the difference between CSS and JavaScript. But the interesting part that you note is that if I want to manipulate any of those styles in JavaScript, I want to do anything after the page is loaded, I have to actually use this version, right? So I'm duplicating my work, I'm duplicating um, the work that I have to do to actually write software that works, that I have to restyle everything in JavaScript. <coughs> so that's one, one other thing that I didn't have before, which is it's not consistent, right? CSS, it, it only works for the initial page load, and then it doesn't work ever again because we have camel casing versus dash casing. So let's take some advice from the guy who wrote JavaScript, and let's always bet on it, right? So, what does JavaScript, and what, what does it have available to us? Oh, well, it's got variables, functions, interoperability, dependency management. Why the heck are we using preprocessors? Why are we using these languages that were written by, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna say anything, because I know some of the guys that write things like SAS, but they're not the smartest guys. Um, it's also, you know, there's been 20 years of work put into JavaScript, right? And things don't happen overnight, changes don't happen overnight. It's a great programming language, and it's ubiquitous. It's already in your browser. So let's look at what it would look like if we wrote our CSS in JavaScript, right? You might have a variable called styles, which has an object that then has a selector, right, like body. Um, potentially, we could even, and this will be fun for you guys, oh, look at this, you can edit it slides right in line. Woo, right? That's pretty cool, right? Um, so I, you know, I could put like top body, or main, or whatever, right? So now I have sort of, and I can nest things, right? I could have nested, let's do this. Let's see how good this will be. This is really just a code reader plugin. Uh, so I've nested, I have like an A tag, no live coding, this is bound to fail. Uh -oh. uh, so text, let's say decoration, and I know you all do this, right? None. That's, accept that's bad for accessibility, you people. I know you do it. I do it. Um, so JavaScript styles. Just writing our styles in JavaScript, it, it, this sounds very interesting, and it seems like it has a lot of benefits. So this is the climax. We've gotten to the climax. Okay, yeah, you can all start laughing. It's fine. We can pretend we're back in high school. Um, but it's Act 3, right? It's the climax. This is the good stuff. So JavaScript styles. Let's dive in. Um, so how would we how would we start to you know really utilize this for our code, right? Well, this is how variables would look. Just listen to JavaScript. We don't have to learn new ways of defining variables. Like I don't need an at symbol or a money sign. What are they what are they doing? Why are they, why are they doing that? You're, you're gonna soon and hopefully walk out of this room thinking, man, I never want to touch SAS again. I never want to touch SAS again. Darcy will hit me if I move. Um, yes, I will. I will hit you. I'm sorry, no, I won't. That's, that's, that's right. I'm sorry, is that part of your code of content? But anyways. Um, talk is over. Talk is over. Um, but this is really simple. Uh, this is really simple to implement and uh, easy to, to see the benefits of, right? So again, I'm just creating some variables. This is what functions would look like. I could write a nice little percent function. Um, and, and when you start to think in your head, you're, if we're just writing JavaScript, to create these you know, style objects. Um, now there's this whole wealth, this huge community that has already written a ton of mixins. That's like my biggest pain point, right? Does anybody like the word mixin? It's a function, okay? They're crazy. They want to call it mixin because they have to create all new syntax to interpret that it was a function. Um, awesome, so this is how modules would work. Guess what you guys have available to you? You CSS developers, you now have NPM. You can go on and use any module that's on NPM. You just require it, you include a package JSON, and now you can um, do things like dependency management. So I can actually export this chunk 
of uh, this style chunk, and then I can include it. So as you can see at the top here, I've required a file that's called variables. So you can imagine that what you guys have probably done in the past is create a variables file for your SAS, your LES, whatever it is, and then you would, can include it. So here I've included it, and you can tell that I've got you know a primary color probably in there, some fonts with the base size. It's really ugly, so I'm like, well, there's ES6. So then we can do some nicer string, or string interpolation, right? And then we can do nicer imports, and now you're like, ooh, this is really looking good, right? The developers in the audience are like, yeah, this is great. Um, so this is looking very powerful, right? And we're using a single language that becomes ubiquitous throughout your code base. And for anybody like me, you know, I look at CoffeeScript, I'm like, no more semicolons, no more, hey, come on. Nobody, nobody, anybody, any Rails, Python, guys, come on. There's gotta be some of you out there with that white space dependent, it's great. But this is beautiful, right? This looks like my stylus code, which I was a big fan of, but it's time to break up. Um, awesome, so you're saying, how can I implement this right now? There's a project called JavaScript Style Sheets, and anybody that saw my original talk years ago must have heard about documented style sheets. That was a project I started. I did not start this, so it will be well maintained and regularly maintained, right? Um, and you can actually, it actually integrates with PostCSS. Now, the really interesting aspect of writing your styles in JavaScript is that we can do really interesting things like runtime compilation. So, you know, you ship, like, let's say, an IE style sheet. Well, we could use the user agent and just not ship that code, right? We can actually make conditionals that would take out uh, chunks of CSS um, uh, that we ship to the, to the browsers. And then we can also use that JavaScript inside the browser to do things like animations and animation, animate between um, states. <coughs> so this is what it looks like. Again, this is sort of a gulp file. Um, if you want to use and are using, let's say, PostCSS, um, all we have to do is sort of change things a little bit. We require the PostCSS JS um, uh, package, and now we can have we can be looking in a styles folder again, but this time we're looking for JavaScript files. Not looking for CSS. It's done. It's over. It's over. It's done. So if you came here and you're like, I want React, Darcy, you said there was going to be like React or inline styles. Are you going to put in, you know? Uh, nail in that coffin. Um, if you don't know what React is, um, essentially it's a JavaScript framework to help you build single page applications or primarily help you sanely deal with um, state and data. Um, and this is a, just an example of, let's say, a React component that could implement styles. Um, so, kind of interesting um, how they, you know, you really overuse. Uh, properties um, in HTML elements, and this can be looked at as a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I look at it as sort of a bad thing. This is what it would essentially generate, right? Inline styles. So we code before um, we created a styles object there, and then we just include it into the button um, element, and then we generate something like this, where the styles, you know, color is B A D A five five, right? You know, the best one, best one ever. Um, and of course, there's actually a project called Radium that lets you, helps you do this, helps you do inline styles and, train, and actually um, uh, creating state, stateful objects for your styles. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, and neither is my buddy Miko. He works for a very cool company, Gem3. Who knows that company? Anybody? No. Go and look up their website. <coughs> Gem3.com. They do amazing uh, work. They just released uh, the new Vikings website, if anybody's seen that. You should go see it or go check it out. Um, so he did some testing and he was like, man, it was really slow to utilize React's uh, props, um, like essentially to be utilizing uh, React to uh, be animated your properties, your CSS properties. And that's because it's all doing all this diffing and all you want to do is essentially transition um, from, let's say, um, tra like a transformed uh, div, like top left, you want to change the position somehow, you know what the property should be, you don't really need uh, React to be doing all the diffing. Um, so it can be really slow, so inline styles are not really the way forward. Um, so kind of last, Act 5, the resolution, 
Uh, there's a name for this or that we've kind of come up with, this, this concept, the higher level concept. Um, Axel Rochmeyer, who I actually talked to when I was in uh, Germany uh, two months back when I gave like this, the bigger talk, this talk is like actually supposed to be like an hour long. You guys are missing out on a lot of stuff. Um, and he wrote a blog post at one point um, talking about isomorphic JavaScript, which is server-side and client-side application logic and sharing, sharing code and views and everything. Uh, essentially what Node.js allows you to do, which is share code on the server-side as well as on the front end. <coughs> and so he sort of said that the term isomorphic, if you've ever heard it, sounds really daunting. So he was like, let's, uh, let's come up with a, a new word global, universal, then we had like three words for it, you know, universal JavaScript, like we're using JavaScript on the front end as well as on the back end. It's not very good, it's not very catchy. So I sort of read through his words again and picked up this one sort of sentence, which was, um, well, he says right here, nobody knew what the hell that we were talking about when we said isomorphic JavaScript. Um, but then he said these two words, right? But now, instead of just writing JavaScript. People knew we were writing isomorphic JavaScript. And I was like, just JavaScript, there? Yeah. It's all just JavaScript, right? TM, right? TM, it's all just JavaScript. So what, what kind of stack are you writing on these days? What's your application on? Well, it's all just JavaScript, right? JJ, JJ. Yeah, JJ, <laughs> sounds pretty good. It's pretty simple, it's kind of catchy, right? I got a sticker on here. Um, but you can essentially use JavaScript for everything. Your style sheets now, as I've showed you, and, and you can investigate more on your own. Uh, for client-side application logic, your templates should all be in JavaScript. Your tasks can be in JavaScript. Your server-side, everything. It's all in JavaScript, right? I'm happy I'm not a CSS like conference right now or something. But everything can be in JavaScript, right? So there's, we have stickers somewhere. I don't have any on me, I'm sorry. I'm usually the swag man. Everybody knows me by that. That's why I have stickers on the bottom of my laptop because I have no space left. Um, but just JavaScript. So this is a concept and uh, although I've shown you and I can give you guys some of the links to the resources that I've shown, so you can actually start implementing uh, this concept. Um, but if somebody asks you, you know, you went to this talk and there's you rambled on for a while and you talked about drama and all this stuff, and they ask you, you know, what is the future of uh, CSS? You should come back and be like, it's just JavaScript. <laughs> JavaScript is everywhere, right? <laughs> Woody looks really afraid, but I'm telling you, don't be afraid. It's great. It's awesome. So uh, thank you so much uh, for having me, and then let me know if you have any questions. I love you all. Questions? Anybody? Can you put up where we can find JSS? Yep. Yeah, uh, so I'll just go back here. It's in the slides. Actually, I think I have it open. Because Google ain't got it open. Also, beautiful uh, Note School of Toronto. Just so you Woo! know, this website is getting all rebuilt. Uh, right now, it should be, uh, it's actually open source. So you guys can go check it out. Um, it's actually being rewritten in all just JavaScript so you can see the, uh, how essentially I implement all this stuff. Um, well, CSS, JSS, so uh, github.com, uh, JSS styles slash JSS. It's got almost 900 stars in GitHub. It's a very actively maintained project right now. Um, and again, it integrates really well into PostCSS. And the great thing is actually that they've created a nice little REPL, right? A little playground for you to go test out and you can be like, here, this is just some JavaScript. And it actually generates, this is the CSS it actually generates, right? And the fun thing is you can uh, be utilizing um, that JSON object in your front end application code and be manipulating it and regenerating your CSS, right? It's crazy, it's awesome. Um, so there's a little playground, the REPL, um, is linked to right at the top there of the project, so that's kind of And then I'll also make sure that the, the slides are up uh, afterwards. Any other questions? Yeah. So essentially, you're using JavaScript as a preprocessor to produce your CSS, is that correct? Correct, yeah. So you're using JavaScript not as a preprocessor, really. Um, it will do 
Um, essentially, what you do when you create um, a big JavaScript object, uh, you will. It's almost essentially like if you had a two string that was on that object. Um, it will create like you know the CSS version, but you can still shift the JavaScript version of your styles because that's really what you want in the end. Now, if you want like a fast <coughs> truth, which has been talked about for a long time, you might want to shift like a subset of the CSS and right into your HTML um, for the initial load. But after after that, really, you, because of like the way that client side applications work, um, you're probably going to be shifting your styles more closely to views. Um, so you may not see the need to actually be doing sort of a pre-compilation of your CSS. This is way more dynamic, yeah. And it's more one-to-one, -one, right? Because again, when you were writing CSS before, you would have to do a transformation anyways because CSS naturally was not one-to-one -one as soon as you got into the browser and you wanted to manipulate the styles, right? So um, you know, things like jQuery were um, if anybody remembers doing animations with jQuery, right, jQuery Animate, um, they were doing already some polyfilling for you so you could write um, CSS looking, um, or past CSS looking objects to those methods and then they would figure out, oh, we'll camel case this and we'll do that um, to actually manipulate, manipulate the properties on the DOM. Um, so the, when I saw this the first time, it kind of changed my opinion of it first time I saw it in styles, I thought it was garbage, and I saw the inheritance and everything that you did. Sure. Um, how much does it affect the page width if uh, like you're coming from like, your after CSS style, has dot button, color blue, and now you've got 100 buttons on the page, all on the inline color blue. So I'm actually against inline style. So uh, I sort of briefly tapped on that. Uh, I showed the one tweet from my friend Amigo who actually said that there, there's an issue there. Um, uh, conceptually, JSS, you can ship um, it, it gives you the ability to work around the global namespace issue, which is essentially you could be shipping um, CSS or styles that are specific to a component and they get nicely um, encapsulated. It gives you that encapsulation. Um, and then you would want to somehow, um, the first team I ever talked to about this was like four or five years ago, a guy named Nick Fisher at SoundCloud. They were injecting style sheets right into the DOM in line. At that time, it was a backbone application in line with the view. Um, and of course, you're, you're dealing with a little bit more bloat there. If you understand the state of your application, you could build up the CSS for initial boot if you're using Node on the back end and ship that CSS right away. And you don't have to actually be applying it in line on a sort of view level. Um, you can be utilizing that object in memory once you, you get into the, into the browser, which is the powerful thing. Right? So if you want to do an animation from, let's say, the, the initial um, styles to, um, let's say, sort of like uh, on load styles, like some sort of transition or fade in, then you would have that object there and you'd be like, oh, this is the, um, now this is the state. And I could kind of mark that out to show you, but essentially you would want, um, let's say this is font, just imagine like, you can create, because it's, it's essentially a flexible JavaScript object. You can create your own keywords, like key value pairs for, for states, right? So you could be like, um, I don't know, bloated. Right, and you'd be like opacity, whoa. Um, it's, it's, it, there you go. So then uh, loaded is now an object, and I could be using that, referencing that that this style is inline like view. Uh, but I don't, I'm not promoting inline styles at all. Uh, I don't like the way that React does that at all. What about scope styles? Um, so scope styles, uh, it's called all. And um, you can reset your styles and template things and you know, be smart about it. So uh, if you, would, I have a lot of opinions of web, web components and, um, and um, the shadow DOM, and that's like a whole nother discussion, and uh, I think it's, I'll take that off the line for you, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? No, you want to just hang out later? It's cool. Awesome, thank you so much.